Opened in 1890, the mighty fourth bridge stands even today as a symbol of strength, ingenuity, and the long-term results of over-engineering. In the time period of the bridge's construction, it wasn't out of the question to build so quickly and so poorly that even rail bridges would be flimsy and rushed. From the ingenuity of railway ferries that predated major rail bridges to the tragic Tay Rail Bridge collapse, the fourth bridge was born from some very dramatic and deadly lessons. Hello everyone, this is Sam with Brick and Mortar, home of the Collapse series, Tragic Tales and more. If episodes on engineering, structural, man-made feats and failures throughout history interest you, consider checking out more of what the channel has to offer after this video. So why was the fourth bridge almost a disaster? Well, we have to go back to a time where both the Firth of Forth and Tay, in these areas of Scotland, were seen as quite the obstacle. Hazards to be avoided and for passenger trains, bypassed by the long westerly route, or for getting goods across via treacherous, unpredictable ferry services. It was a time when rail travel was quickly becoming prominent though. To cross either Firth directly would mean a massive time savings, and in this climate of fierce railway competition, an obvious advantage for the rail line who would pioneer it. The North British Railway, or NBR, Caledonian Railway, Edinburgh and Northern Railway, and all others were competing in this area essentially for control of major routes and the race to the north, timed races between rail companies, was initially London to Edinburgh in the 1880s. While these railway companies never officially publicized or acknowledged these races, it became widely known they were taking place regardless, the results of which to this day still debated. At issue though was the Edinburgh to Aberdeen portion, an effort to bridge the Lothians and Fife regions with Dundee and Aberdeen, both the Firth of Forth and Tay sitting right in the way of this crucial northernmost leg and main population centers for Scotland. It was 1849 when the newly appointed engineer and manager for Edinburgh and Northern Railway, or ENR, the up-and-coming Thomas Bouch, in his late 20s, made railway history. ENR needed a way to get goods across both Firths more efficiently, but by this point, bridge engineering was only in its infancy. Quickly evolving, yes, but not quite reasonable to expect crossings of such distance by anything more than ferries, and at the time, the ferry services were erratic, inefficient, and subject to weather conditions, quite the opposite to the needs of companies moving large quantities of goods on a regular basis. Bouch eagerly presented his quite unorthodox idea at the time, the train ferry. A sidewheel steamboat, fitted with railway tracks down the middle of its deck, for freight cars only, not passengers, would be capable of loading and unloading from both bow and stern. Prior to this, in the time period, goods were hauled across by boat, then loaded and offloaded by crane, a slow and cumbersome process involving multiple steps before freight could get back underway on nearby rail lines. With Bouch's flying bridge system, as he named it, a platform could travel up and down on rails mounted along a dock ramp. It could match the deck level with the steamboat, regardless of water level, and a bridge, also fitted with railway track, would then be lowered onto the deck allowing the rolling stock to be pulled or pushed across with minimal resistance, and being hinged, the bridge also able to flex under the varying conditions. Although radical as a concept at the time, its implementation would prove quite useful, and was quickly adopted. And thus, the world's first roll-on, roll-off ferry was born, the aptly named Leviathan, the very first vessel of its type, which was used to cross at Granton and Burnt Island. Several more were added across the Forth and even one on the Tay. The railroads being in control of these vessels meant they could be pushed hard, night and day if necessary. There were of course others with similar ideas in the time period, but Bouch's was the first actually put into practice, and therefore credited with its invention. Row Row Ferries, as they would come to be known, took the world by storm and to this day, the roll-on, roll-off vessels are commonly used for conveying land vehicles across bodies of water. Military, passenger vehicles, cargo, combination row packs vessels, ferries that handle both vehicles and passengers, and some row rows even still dedicated to trains in a few parts of the world today. Although modern versions primarily incorporate the bridge and ramp into the vessel's own design instead. Sir Thomas Bouch, proving himself to be a competent, if a bit eccentric, and frugal civil and structural engineer, was instrumental in multiple successful railway projects as well by the 1850s and early 1860s. 
Most importantly, to the railway companies who commissioned him, his contributions to design and engineering in the cheapest, quickest way possible, many feel were his most redeeming qualities, at least for those clients whose bottom line came first. But Bouge wasn't content with floating railways and establishing cheap train lines. He had always thought big, really big, and iron lattice bridges would become one of his specialties. It's crucial that rail lines maintain as level a gradient as possible, and in the UK's mountainous areas, this can be especially difficult. These larger-than-life projects, carried out on a shoestring budget, made Bouch's love for the iron lattice and similar practices a perfect fit. In the meantime, Bouch had always been inspired, though, to go even bigger. He'd wanted to enact plans for bridges over both Firths for years. In 1871, with approval given to the North British Railways, Tay Bridge Act, and then, in 1873, when the Fourth Bridge Company was formed, he'd finally have his chance at both. While the Tay Bridge was almost exclusively a North British Railways, or NBR, project, the undertaking to cross the Fourth took the joint funding of four railway companies, Great Northern, Northeastern, Midland, and NBR. Ironically, both undertakings were just as massive, each in their own unique ways, and the Tay Bridge was even a bit longer. The fourth bridge, however, would be towering, imposing in height by comparison, along with the difference in depth at this point of the fourth, and Bouch's plans weren't the only proposals in the running. Although the actual idea itself to cross the fourth is a matter of much speculation, with dreams and visions to cross it dating back potentially as far as the Roman Imperial period. In 1805, an idea to tunnel underneath the fourth was proposed, and some believe taken somewhat seriously albeit only in consideration though, as no evidence is reportedly known that it was ever acted upon. This tunnel would have been a reported 15 feet in width and height, and during the fourth bridge inquiry later on, with such steep gradients, tunnels would get ruled out entirely anyway, as it would require many extra miles to account for steep approaches. In 1911 came what is thought to be the first true bridge proposals on record, three variants by civil engineer James Anderson, each differing in height. However, Anderson's ideas called for only 2,500 tons of iron, distributed across his multiple 1,500-foot spans. That's compared to the 20,000 tons of Bouch's future proposal and 54,000-plus tons of steel as it stands today. Anderson's proposal was described to be very light and slender in appearance, so light indeed that on a dull, foggy day, it would hardly have been visible, and after a heavy gale, probably no longer to be seen on a clear day either. These proposals made long before the bridge inquiry even turned serious, though. In 1873, the Fourth Bridge Company, a joint company of the four funding railways, was founded and the inquiry chose a suspension bridge of Bouch's design, with two main spans at 1,600 feet long each. The company would set about preparing offices, workshops, and equipment near Queens Ferry, and brickwork foundations would begin near Inverkeithing. By 1879, the first of eight brick piers would be started on Inchgarvey Island. These first few steps, the stones laid with, quote, great ceremony. The Tay Bridge, the other high-profile, low-budget project of Bouches, had been open and operating for just over a year, when, in December of 1879, disaster would strike as the Tay Bridge collapsed. The tallest section, known as the High Girders, atop their flimsy iron latticework columns, had blown over and into the freezing River Tay, with an NBR passenger train trapped inside, imprisoned underwater, proving fatal for all souls on board. I'll have a link in description and pinned comment for my in-depth video on the Tay Bridge disaster. After the investigations and inquiries into the causes and circumstances, it was found that Bouch's designs, combined with rushed, shoddy workmanship, had led unequivocally to the bridge's demise. Bouch, having been involved in so many projects across the UK by this point, especially bridges, a top iron lattice work, meant the fallout from the Tay collapse would be extensive. For his part, Bouch would set about immediately trying to rectify some of the issues in his current bridges that showed similarities to the Tay Bridge, but by this point it could not be ignored. And in this era of UK's quickly evolving railway system, public safety had slowly started to emerge as something to be taken more seriously. Bouch's previous bridges would be demolished or replaced, and as for the fourth bridge, Construction was halted immediately, as confidence in his design was now, well, non-existent. It was a sobering time, though, and while the Tay incident was one of many railway catastrophes, 
many steps that led toward the UK's eventual sweeping changes in regulation. Bouch had involvement in so many completed projects nationwide, even earning knighthood upon the Tay Bridge's grand opening, bestowed by Queen Victoria soon after crossing it. His health already on the decline, Bouch would pass just two months after the Tay Collapse investigation had concluded, along with subsequent decisions to start replacing his works. It's been said Bouch's funeral at Dean Cemetery in November of 1880 saw the steadfast 100-foot-tall Dean Bridge of Thomas Telford's keeping vigil nearby, overlooking Dean Gardens and Cemetery, a bridge that had already stood for decades, the Silvery Forth to the north, the now abandoned workshops near Queens Ferry, the allegory, the poetic irony, historical events can easily rival even today's great dramas. It can seem otherworldly in our modern times, a structure so imposing and overwhelming in size, built in appearance so simply, and to withstand just about anything, yet can still be so aesthetically pleasing, as many consider it today. In some ways, this was intentional. To begin with, the site of the crossing would remain the same, but the suspension bridge was abandoned altogether. And after the Joint Railway's Fourth Bridge Company consulted with the UK's Board of Trade, the continuous girder, cantilever design of Sirs John Fowler and Benjamin Baker was chosen in May of 1881. With much experience of their own, the renowned Mr. Fowler and Baker had a history of this beauty through strength of design, and the fourth bridge, with construction underway by 1880, would exemplify this. Substandard iron also proved to be at fault in the Taybridge collapse, so the use of the highest quality steel would be paramount for the superstructure now more than ever. A huge leap forward for engineering as a whole in the time period. Let no steel be employed which would not comply with the requirements of the Admiralty, Lloyd's, and the underwriter's registry. The old offices and workshops of Bouch, now expanded and repurposed, the new, much more girthy fourth bridge would require terraces for the approach on the Queens Ferry side, several more workshops throughout other areas nearby, telegraph cables between them, the buildup of Inchgarvey Island, the creation of a seawall, the list goes on. At a cost of roughly 3.2 million pounds at the time, approximately 420 million today, compared to the paltry 217,000 pounds of the original Tay Bridge, and with construction commencing by 1882, Mr. Fowler and Baker entrusted the project to renowned problem solver William Errol, their lead contractor. Being the first steel bridge of its kind, Errol would also invent many of the steelworking methods that made this feat possible. The bridge would be a mile and a half long, or approximately 8,100 feet in total length, three cantilever towers with two spans at 1,700 feet between them, the longest cantilever spans at the time, a record that wouldn't be surpassed until 1919 when the second iteration of the Quebec Bridge was completed with a single span of 1,800 feet. Of those 1,700-foot spans, each center section, a 500-foot-long subassembly on its own. A deck height of 150 feet and cantilever tower heights of roughly 360 feet above the waterline, sunken case and piers of granite and concrete. Tubular girder members made up of thousands of tons of curved steel plates would comprise the majority of the 5,300-foot, just over one-mile-long superstructure. The subassemblies raised, fully assembled, and temporarily bolted into position for preliminary testing of joint viability in testing areas on the South Shore. Once verified, disassembled only to be raised once more into final position, held temporarily by bolts again, then followed up with teams of riveters to make their fastenings final. 6.5 million rivets in total, expansion joints between the cantilevers well ahead of their time, allowing complete freedom for longitudinal expansion. All this anchored to the supporting piers using an ingenious key plate system that allowed the entire superstructure, each cantilever tower, rotational and translational movement atop the foundations to compensate for the massive amount of thermal expansion a structure like this will endure. Projects on this scale, especially at the time, weren't without their own hazards though either, and a reported 73 men lost their lives in its construction. When the bridge is loaded, the upper members are brought into tension, while the lower members are in compression. Sir Benjamin Baker himself, taking doubters to school on the concept of cantilevers in 1889, at the Royal Institution in London. Bricks, ropes, broomsticks, three men, and two chairs was all Baker needed to prove it. Opened in January of 1890 after much testing, it was a ceremony for the history books. In attendance were the Prince of Wales 
and then King Edward VII drove home a final, gold-plated rivet. Still performing its intended duties to this day, unlike many other bridges of its age, with minimal issue, the bridge to me, in a way, stands as a rare, physical testament to what can be possible when we don't allow those lives lost in engineering failures to have been in vain. There is so much to be said about the fourth bridge, I could never fit it all into one video. The esteemed architect Alfred Waterhouse would lament its distinct lack of intentional ornaments and aesthetic shapes, instead celebrating its unique beauty that happened more or less unintentionally through direct purpose of function. Stating in a commentary to Sir John Fowler, fortunately no attempt was made to desecrate the bridge itself with flimsy adornments. It was allowed to stand out in simple and impressive grandeur. A memorial was unveiled in May of 2012 to honor those lives lost in the fourth bridge's construction.